This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you very much for the introduction that these questions yeah, cannot be go further beyond that level. Thank you so much. And also thank you for inviting me here, especially as a Canadian, I come back about 10 years after that was a really nice meeting. Yeah, last night I even walked through some of the building by Tech, Morrison Hall, a lot of things to um, Okay. Um, so this talk I put on uh, my lab server. So all these slides uh, on that server is called uh, zzlab.net slash share. So then you will find the slide there. So you don't need to uh, take a picture. So you will get a uh, high quality uh, slide from there. Great. Um, Cornell ranks the number one in the plant breeding education research. So then what do we do in this genomic area? Essentially, we try to answer two complementary questions. One is explanation, and another one is the prediction. For explanation, we try to, in the old day, uh, maybe uh, still now, we have a kind of gene when we try to verify it, cloning it, that's kind of a backward. Or we do not have knowledge on those genes, then we try to find them, fishing them, using linkage analysis or GWAS, then we try to clone them again. The, for the prediction, you know, we maybe initially start with the marker season selection, then try to do genome-wide, then maybe GWAS plus genome selection, and the, maybe in the future, there will be the uh, artificial intelligence. So that means that uh, backward and forward, those approach, they can go back uh, each other. So then this GWAS also help genomic uh, prediction. So then prediction also can be used at one method try to validate the GWAS result. So then today I'm going to talk about um, most of this stuff except the validation of the red color. Major focus will be on the prediction. So then we will divide the talk into the following section. First, we go through the process from marker selection to genome uh, uh, selection. Then we talk about the problem with this prediction uh, business. Then we talk about the problem in the literature that's muddy water, how we can help everyone. We see that clearly. Then we try to figure out what's the reason that uh, uh, on the hidden overfeeding problem. Finally, yeah, maybe before artificial intelligence even uh, take everything, we try to uh, do our best to improve our accuracy. And uh, first, let's talk about uh, uh, marker selection. Everything starts from this DNA. Then from the DNA, we can measure it with a different genotype. Then we call them one, two, uh, zero, one, two. Then we can try to do the regression. Okay, so then for this regression, we can have a two approach. One is uh, this sort of uh, uh, top down approach. So that means, uh, for example, in other Buckethorst lab, we have uh, used this marker, try to develop the kin shape. Then with this kin shape, we can make a direct prediction on those individuals, those breeding value. So then the skin shape, we can change it. We can use some selected marker or compress into group. Then we can develop a series of flop approach. Or another way is the bottom up. So that means we start from the value of the marker, then sum them up, then try to get the breeding value. Then those distribution, yeah, we need to have a sort of assumption. Then different assumption create like a different basing approach, okay? 
So then we can think about this business, uh, see how this river start from. Like I said, everything start from the downway east. Uh, that's from Morrison Hall. Uh, Charles Henderson get his first job as an assistant professor at the Cornell, but he's uh, originally thought from start from Iowa State, but he developed that one uh, all the way. I think uh, the most uh, publication coming from 1970 uh, during that period. So that's a block. So then the next one tried to use the marker. That one go back to Iowa. So Rahan Fernando, yeah, get this marker into this breathing value. Yeah, integral with the blob. So then the next one, uh, 1994, that's the uh, Frank Breeder, uh, Rex Fernando. I think everybody know him. Um, but unfortunately, you know, that time did not get a lot of attention from our community until Okay, 2001. Okay, uh, Mewis and Binhez and Godard, they published this genetic paper. And basically they, they show how to use the entire marker compared to the marker system, how that is more useful. Okay, that one get a, this community realized the genome selection. That's a really big contribution. Um, but uh, still not get used. Then in 2007, Delvin, like, he's the correspondent author. I'm the first author. Ed and Rory Tata Hunter from West Group joined as the co-author. We actually, we reinvented that people of method. Okay. Um, the good thing is that paper published in animal science. Uh, animal the reader read it. So Paul Van Raden the next year applied to the USDA, the dairy science, uh, dairy evaluation. Then genome selection, boom. The reason is uh, that the regression, uh, this uh, uh, basic approach is uh, computing difficult and does not match the existing thing. So then for this G block, we just replace the pedigree relationship with the marker relationship. So the coding is very easy. Then that program get used immediately. Then the next contribution is from Ignacio Nisto and try to use existing pedigree combined with the marker-based pedigree. Uh, until now, that's dominant the animal breed. Okay. Then later on, I did some um, uh, improvement on that kinship, use either compress to the group or use a more meaningful kinship and try to do the super blob. Um, unlike unlike uh, GWAS method. So GWAS, if you method A is better than B, no matter which solution that's true. But uh, for the genome selection, that's different. And the order can be reversed by different tree, even different population. Okay. So then we figure out the two factors affect this, which one is the best method. Okay. For example, these two factors, including the heart ability and the complexity of the trait. If the trait is a polygene, basically, yeah, that's give up, uh, works robust. But if you have a less gene, then other method, they work much better. And if the treat is lower heritability, then the compress, you make a group, then you have a better prediction. And if the treat have a higher heritability, then the basin approach works better. So it really depends on the situation. So that make it harder for breeder to use it. So then we build this system, basically is a machine learning. So then the machine will look at the data, try to figure out which one is the best for that particular data. Okay, then for that evaluation, actually we have a problem. And the problem can be viewed from this table. So this uh, is a paper from this uh, 
founding father Rex Bernardo <laughs> the paper. Uh, if you look at uh, this prediction accuracy, minus 30, minus 40. Okay. So then uh, interpretation can be a problem. Some people interpret it. Okay, if I reverse the direction, it will still work as good as, for example, 40%. But the problem that may be not true. And I can show why that happened. For example, yeah, we do the cross validation. For example, the here is the five. You can select the four group, try to create another group. And after this, you will get a prediction for every group. Now, extreme situation is leave one out. You try to predict that individual, use the rest. Then you just loop. The problem is actually we have a two way try to calculate this Pearson correlation. For example, on the left side, I have that solid. That is the group we try to make a predict. So we had the phenotype, use the rest to make a prediction. So after we get a prediction that red, so for each group, we can calculate the Pearson correlation immediately. So that means we get instant accuracy. So then we get a five, we take average as the final. But again, we can also use a different way. For each fold, after we get a prediction when we hold, we don't calculate until we get all the file group predicted. Then we make one calculus at the very last. So that means, yeah, we have that hold average. So there are two ways to calculate this pre-correlation. One is the instant for each fold. Or hold, that means after you get for every fold, then you make one calculation. So in the literature, uh, you can see the variation between these two, and some they don't tell you exactly what happens. Then the problem is these two are different. For example, I use the add that uh, uh, 281 that uh, flowering time means as a uh, path. I just sh shuffling that phenotype, break the connection between phenotype and genotype, and see what's happening. So expectation should be zero. You should not have accuracy because it's already broken. Then we try to see whether these two approach, they get a zero, that expectation. So I divide them into five groups. Then for each group, if you look at the, uh, the correlation for each group and the rest that reference, so then you will see they are just on the opposite side of the population mean. Okay, so that means if you look uh, somewhere here, uh, solid stand the, the testing, then the open is for the reference. So they just on the opposite side of the population mean. So then that means they are 100% negatively correlated to each other. Then the problem is the training population, if you have a higher phenotype, then you tend to have a higher prediction. So then it's completely reverse to the breeding value. So that means you're supposed to get a zero expectation, but they end up for this simulation, you get a negative 5%. So that means don't work bad. The problem gets even worse with number of the fold. You can see, so here expectation should be zero, but the number of fold increase, then that bias increase for that red color, that hold accuracy. So the more fold, more bias. If you have a jack nav, like leave one out, that's the worst one. So actually, jack nav should not be used. And so you can see, can easily like reach like a 15% negative for the whole accuracy. 
Then you see, oh, the blue one pretty good. That's instant. So that means you get a fold, calculate immediately, then average. Then no problem here. But it also has another problem. So you, you're intuitive. You have more training data, then you have a better accuracy, right? So that means if you do the experiment, you have a more fold, then your training data is larger. Then you're supposed to get uh, higher accuracy. So then you will see that instant, that the blue one start to have a problem. So it just started with increase with the number of folds, but at a certain point, drop very quickly. Why? That's related to the size of the testing population. The size is small, it's get bad. Okay. Uh, usually, maybe after 30, it's sort of okay. But if you have less, especially when you do uh, like a small training, uh, testing size, then that's really get a big problem. The good thing is for this instant accuracy, we have a way to try to correct it. So actually, Fisher already did this for us a yeah, long, long time ago. So then we start to use this Fisher correction. So then you see that uh, uh, a black line. So it then start to have uh, not like the blue one. So they quickly like a uh, drop. So then that uh, black line that corrected instant accuracy, then they start to make sense. That means more training data, then you have a more accuracy. Uh, the take home message, there are two ways to try to calculate this prediction accuracy, Pearson correlation. Both are downward bias. Then instant accuracy is uh, correctable. So then you can use that feature a correction, correct that uh, instant method. But uh, for that hold accuracy, so far I have not found a method to correct yet. But this, the problem is in the literature, people still using that hold accuracy, even the new one up a lot, try to evaluate the accuracy. So then the true accuracy might be done uh, Underestimated, especially using the whole accuracy on the leaving one of that strategy. Okay. So when the true accuracy is low, negative that the Pearson correlation could appear, yeah, with the unprecedented like a frequency and magnitude. That's kind of explain why Rex Bernardo's that uh, result uh, can have a uh, like a 40 percent negative correlation. So then we see more problem. See this muddy water. Uh, yeah, because Rex Bernardo is a founding father in this area, I'm trying to uh, start with him. He has a paper 2014, uh, just at the time I left Cornell, uh, proposed a very uh, meaningful direction for the genomic selection. So that means the genome selection if you have an existing non-genes, uh, you should incorporate that into your prediction model. That makes sense. Yeah, that helps. And later on, there are a lot of research follow this direction, breeding program, try to implement this, try to improve accuracy. But the problem, when the literature starts to accumulate, people are doing a lot of different things, then we start to see rare stuff. For example, one paper showing if you incorporate the GWAS result into genome selection, you can easily get a two-fold increase on accuracy. For example, originally it was 40 percent, now you get 80 percent. Um, let me see this. Yeah, you see that one? Five times increase. Yeah, then we think about if that's true or not. So then we try to see if we figure out, uh, is any other potential problem maybe confounded uh, this phenomenon? So then let's see how people to do this. So 
So then this one I label as a valid frog. So that means you go through this process and you should be fine. The result should be reliable. So when you get data, you divide them into training and testing first. Then for the training, you start to conduct a GWAS. Then figure out which one is sorted with the tree. And with those one, you calculate the breeding value of the testing population. Then try to correlate it with the phenotype. Then you get accuracy. So this is the value. So this accuracy hold. But uh, the problem people doing the different. Right? They get the data, the entire population, then immediately they doing the GWAS. Then they know which one associated with the tree. Okay. So then we say whether this GWAS result work or not, prediction accuracy is good or bad. So then they start to, to do the validation. So they divide the population into training and testing. So then try to see those are certain results, what's the effect? Then they do the prediction. Then they do the correlation. The problem is that the testing population, that the phenotype is already being used in this diagram. So then that caused hidden overfeeding. Then they do this again and again, but this is potentially can increase your accuracy two times, five times, or I just easily reach 100%. Okay. So then we, we did like a test. So we, yeah, like we did before, we randomly shuffle the phenotype, break the connection between phenotype and the genotype. You suppose to get the accuracy of a zero, okay. So then we try to look at the accuracy of the training. Of course, it's uh, uh, you look at the data already, then you do the prediction on the training, you get the accuracy 40% above. That makes sense, okay. Then because nobody tried to look at the training population. Then we need to look at the testing population. Then for the testing population here, you see, the green color and the red color, they are on the expectation zero. That approach is a rigid regression. Okay, they don't have a problem. They, doing, they don't do the GWAS, look at the data first. And also doing the GWAS first, then incorporate into the prediction, but it is with valid method. So that means you divide the population into training and testing first. And they don't have a problem. They get an expectation of zero. But the other one can easily get like a 10% increase, even should be zero. And that's the GWAS first with the invalid method, then incorporated into major version. So that means the literature, there are a lot of things tell you this is really good, it works, actually maybe not. And also from Ed Buckler's group, uh, Alice Lippert did a really nice study. And he know the science, how it should be performed. He used the valid approach and tried to verify about the 200 trees simulated to see whether incorporated GWAS result can improve prediction accuracy. Uh, it's end up with uh, about like a one third. Yeah, those incorporations do increase accuracy. But for the majority, still don't. So then the question for us is how we can improve this procedure or improve the GWAS result, try to incorporate into genome selection to improve. So then we need to look at uh, this uh, GWAS business first, okay? So GWAS start from the humans, uh, Eric Lander is the number one, more publication than Darwin, okay? <laughs> okay, 
So then uh, in his population, he used like a structure, the human population. So then you can look uh, within family, try to look at the association. So then that remove the structure. So that works, but that data is limited, especially in animal and the plant. We don't have that structure. So then creature is also cloning. At the Stanford, you meant this Q method and quickly drop that false positive down, but not completely. Um, and that approach uh, is a slow and price in Harvard uh, using principal component tries to speed up. But this is still have a, uh, for the strong population, yeah, is a bigger problem. Now until uh, at this group, Jian Mingyu, he has written visit Morrison Hall and we meet together. We talk about these things, uh, help him uh, quickly publish that nature genetic paper. Okay, so then Jamming's approach is uh, uh, for the GWAS community, now everybody, you have a standard, you have a now distribution. It's not something inflated. Then you can, Bofroni doesn't matter. Yeah, uh, every marker I have a, probably 10 to the minus 20. Then how you divide a million Bofroni tests will work? No. Then Jamming City uh, contribution is get the whole community under control. Okay. So then, yeah, of course, that uh, mixed model approach has a big problem is the computing. Then the good things, community can help. You see, on the left side, they all focus on solving Jamie's problem, yeah, computing speed. And um, they all publish in very good profile journal, like uh, plus genetics or nature genetics, whatever. Then the question, okay, how we can make a further improvement on Jamie's Q plotting model? So that means we are not only control false positive, but also we want to control false negative. So then we see paper continue to come up with a different strategy, including three methods that's very different from red. One is called a MLMM, multiple loci mixed model, and the last two, farm speed and beating. So they use the multiple lockers. So they have a dramatic different power than the rest. And so far we tested uh, beating still rank the number one. Uh, you can test that very easily. You, uh, you go to my lab's website, you click on research, then you will find like a GWAS. Uh, there is R code there, just less than 10. You copy paste it, then about like a few minutes, then on your default uh, working directory, you will have this graph. So this graph simulated like a 20 genes. Then try to see with a different model. For example, you can tell those model easily, uh, just tell which one to use. Then it generates graph. For example, you start from like a simple model, like a general linear model, or mix the linear model, uh, like Q plus K. So they can find about five or six. But uh, when you move to the bottom, for example, farms to be or bidding, you can easily get that one double. You can find 12, like uh, those non genes. Okay, so then these different methods matter. And for a particular user, yeah, for example, you work on biology, you do not read a lot of these method comparisons, it's confusing. Then you can always do it by yourself. You have data, then you just uh, do not use that to fix this, just run again and again. So then you will see which model find more genes in your data. And you can also change your model, for example, change different number of principal components as a covariate. You can also see which one fits the data better. So then we see, yeah, different uh, methodology, then we see different uh, uh, package, for example, including the tassel, 
from Addis Group, then Agabit also initiated from Addis Group. So now I take her care of that one. So then everything, this is the model we implement into the Gabit. So you just tell model equals whatever, okay? A bunch of them. Then we also have this iPad, not iPad. Okay, but they have the same philosophy, try to make it easier. This will have a graphic user interface. In terms of uh, how we can incorporate this GWAS result into prediction, like uh, Alex Lipper indicated, they will use the QK model. Then two thirds do not show the increase on the prediction. So then we try to see what about we improve the method, whether we can improve that one. So then we can see on the left side, that's the G block without incorporation G was without. But uh, when we incorporate the GOM mixed linear model, we see the accuracy increase. And even with the further increase on the very right, you use the beating, you find more true genes, then you have a much better accuracy. Okay. Of course, when I sometimes I say I actually means I refer to myself and also my collaborator, and especially the people of the real hero, they did the work. And that's the, the same graph when I practice my job interview for this position with Ed, I show this graph to Ed. Yeah, that's how it looks uh, in Pullman. Uh, so that's uh, the landscape we have. Uh, maybe one village in New York, they have more trees than the whole area we have. <laughs> okay, very sunny. And you can see easily the landscape. With that, I will try to answer some questions you have. So, Jiwoo, what do you think the opportunities? Uh, I mean, we're kind of coming from the uh, uh, bottom up that you can identify causal variants. You know, how do you think that starts fitting into these types of models? We don't know what the, what the variants do, we just think they're causal. Uh, so how do you think these models can work with causal variants and, you know, this directionality that 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 you need to bring? Uh, one simple, for example, uh, your maze with uh, that 5,000 land races from Mexico, then you show there is a thousand genes control flowering time. If you do flowering time prediction, uh, compared to use the whole genome, SMP, uh, with them equally build a kinship doing the traditional G blob. If you give a different weight for those sovereign gene, then you will definitely you get better. Yeah. Oh, by the way, thank you very much for that uh, project. So that uh, saved me a publication for the beating. Um, when I, Try to publish the beating paper is reviewed by Nature Genetics, but uh, when they see the real samples on those 3,000 lines, uh, they find 50, uh, 45, uh, the association compared with the previous method, like a farm's view, that's only 15, three times increase. Then they get scared, they don't publish that one. So then the paper was rejected everywhere I can submit. So until you publish that paper, you show the resultant gene uh, control means flowering time. Then I say, oh, my chance came. So I just use yours. I divide the whole genome into those gene area and non-gene area. I want to see my 45 gene, whether I have more chance landed on your gene area, actually is get dramatically enriched. Finally, I published that paper with that uh, enrichment oh, by Giga Science. Oh, uh, the the Seeds of Discovery Environmental GWAS project, right? Uh, yeah, without you, then uh, <laughs> now nobody can use BD. Robin. Steve, um, you presented some results, that, at least as I understand it, where, where you kind of take 
she was, and the abuse she was, the, I guess, influence how you treat those partners with no restriction. I mean, how, how does that compare to like some of the Bayesian methodologies where you assume mixtures, you let the model itself kind of sort it out, potentially even use GWAS as a prior? Have you, have you done those kind of comparisons? Yeah. Uh, the question is uh, uh, the incorporation I saw here is a different GWAS method with the G blob. And those GWAS results was incorporated as the covariate in that model. And my guess is if you do the same thing for the basic model, for the basic model, you treat all the markers as a random effect, but you add some fixed effect, just as the way we did in the GML, and that should increase the accuracy for the basic approach, whatever the basic it is. But, but even like even beyond just having the six effects, right? So let's, let's take Bayes R for example, right? We have mixtures of normal. I, I mean, would it have you thought about looking at GWAS hits and, and having that influence prior probabilities of which normal distribution markers might sort out? So uh, I think uh, uh, you are looking for a different way of incorporation. So my way is to incorporate simply as the covariate with the fixed fact. And of course you can incorporate a different way. Uh, you can also treat them as a different weight or different distribution as there is a random effect. That's still possible. Okay. okay. Yeah. For the whole accuracy and the fixed accuracy before, is it I'm wondering, is there a way regarding the Okay, so uh, the question is uh, when we do the cross validation for that dividing the entire population into different fold, uh, instead of randomly, whether you have other way to do the uh, dividing. Yes, of course, there are a lot of way chronically. Uh, for example, you can buy different, uh, uh, for example, like an animal, they have a different family. Then for the breeding material, you can come from like a different material, uh, breeding material, you can be on some like existing knowledge. So then you talk about uh, uh, another way is uh, uh, based on the phenotype. Yeah, yeah this one, I, w I don't have a very clear answer because this one, you touch your phenotype uh, at the very beginning. So then that may be potential has a problem. I need to think about whether one I can divide based on the fold then have the different category. Yeah. Thank you again. <laughs>